Hey team, this is Velasquez and we're back with another fantastic flipped video lecture. And today I want to go ahead and discuss and provide a little bit of background about our branch of government, Congress. And today's focus is specifically on the House of Representatives. So let's go ahead and dig in just as a reminder as we do dig into the flip lecture. It's always a good idea just to have again your um, notebook handy to jot down a few notes. Of course, we'll be uh, discussing some of these um, concepts in class, and again, there'll be some different activities regarding uh, gerrymandering and representation in our modules. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So, as you can see on the screen, the House of Representatives is comprised of 435 members. Now, to be clear, every state gets at least one representative in the House. So. As we know before, right, the House of Representatives is based on population. So one thing to keep in mind is that if a state only has one representative, that representative usually means the representative at large. That's what we call it. So, for example, right, Wyoming has a small population, so their representative is at an at-large representative. Now, hopefully when I say about population representation, this should sort of take you back from our earlier discussion when we talked about um, the foundation of the Constitution and discussing things, for example, like the Great Compromise, right? It was a compromise to have two houses. One would be, again, two per state, which will have the Senate, and then one house would be based on representation. That was a way to kind of balance out um, the voice of the small states versus um, the larger states. So the question is, how do we know a state's population? I think you guys are aware that in Article 1 of the Constitution, it actually specifically directs um, the government, or Congress I should say, to count the population every 10 years. So this is actually called taking the census. So here you can see right now um, the actual article. So Article 1, Section 2 again mentions taking the census. And again, interesting enough, we just completed our 2020 census. Now, of course, I have on the screen, I just want to at least um, remind you, even though we're talking about in this specific focus of this census being used for representation, I also want to share with you the importance of the census because it has to do a lot with apportionment, redistricting, um, civic engagement, um, and then also something to think about, right, is also distribution of funds. So, for example, right, if we're thinking about student loans or grant programs, you can see in the bottom right, Title I grants, special education grants. So when people ask the question, right, why is it important to take the census? Or for some people, right, it's a question of I don't feel comfortable sharing that information with the government. Or there might be a variety of reasons why people um, maybe are hesitant to um, participate in the census. But I at least want to plant the seed for you as a young adult, right? It does come around every 10 years. So again, it'll be 10 years from now that it will be sort of um, administered again. And it's not just a question of voting and representation. There are many, many reasons of why the census is so extremely important. Now, the 2020 census, obviously, for very obvious reasons, right? 2020 was a curveball for us all. So there's lots of things happening this year, which again made the census a little more difficult um, to administer regarding restrictions for COVID-19. There's also, again, several challenges in regards to the current administration at the time. You can see right here we have a recent court case. The Supreme Court actually is going to be hearing um, the Trump order to remove undocumented immigrants from the population count. Now, you can imagine, right, that particular case, if that was allowed, that would definitely um, affect the outcome of, again, reapportionment and funding for congressional districts. So it's really important when we look at the census, right? and really pay attention to what the outcome will be this year and for future. So one thing that I wanted to take a look at, and this, um, this slide kind of does it, even though it's kind of messy here, right? In the House, there is 435 members. So you're probably asking, okay, so why is 435 the magic number, right? Especially if we're talking about the United States, it's growing in population. We must need to be keep adding members of uh, representatives in that case. So the answer is no. So actually after 1910, um, after the 1910 census, Congress actually decided the House of Reps was just getting way too big, right? You're talking about 435 people trying to agree on something, again, pass legislation. 
it wouldn't be as effective, right, if you keep adding more people to the mix. So instead of just increasing the size of the House of Representatives, Congress actually decided to reapportion. So you're going to hear reapportion, and that just kind of think about it, right? It's like redistributes, reorganizes the seats after each census. And this allows for if there's areas of states where they've lost population, right? People have moved away. Um, that is going to affect how big a voice, so to speak, they have in the House of Reps. And the states that are going to gain population, they're probably again going to be adding more um, seats or more voice. So that process is called reapportionment, and it occurs every ten years after we that we take a look at the census. So you're probably asking the question, okay, so who does draw these new lines? Who reorganizes um, this reapportionment? So does Congress draw the lines? So the answer is no. Congress only really tells each state how many reps they'll get, right? So this is kind of your piece. This is how many uh, voices or representatives you get to work with. And then after that, each state is told how many representatives they get. Then it will go to the state legislator. The state legislators are going to, are going to draw districts on their, within their own state, and that's called redistricting. So to be clear, right, um, district is an area that is represented by a person of the House of Representatives. So for example, Anaheim is California's 46th district, or the city of Cyprus would fall in um, the 47th district. So it's interesting enough, the point I want to make here too, um, in 2010, actually California voters passed a proposition joining some other states, I think 11, that actually stripped the state legislature of the job of doing that redistricting. So instead, they actually have given this job of sort of redesigning, reorganizing to an independent panel. And you're probably asking, well, why would they make this change? So the answer really lies in a concept known as gerrymandering. Now, gerrymandering has come into um, the news quite often recently. And I think actually before I get to gerrymandering, let me pause for a minute. Let me show some, some visuals here. So I think I included in this presentation, right, um, this is a picture of California. And you can see all the little yellow, um, the yellow numbers represent the different districts throughout the state. So you can see, of course, um, you know, less population is going to be sort of a larger area versus more densely populated, more people. You can see, for example, in Southern California, it's going to be much more smushed together. So let me zoom in a little bit further here. So this again is looking more, again, specifically Southern California. Um, again, I said earlier the 46th district, which will be right here, Anaheim. And then the city of Cyprus will fall into the 47th district here. So if we're looking at the 47th district, again, uh, Congressional District 47 is uh, represented by Alan Lowenthal. Okay, he's a Democrat at this point. Now, Orange County is very interesting is because, again, we have sort of merged into, um, you know, as per many areas, but Orange County in particular, after the 2020 election, most um, political analysts have really uh, labeled Orange County as quite purple. Uh, Orange County for some time has been predominantly red, which we would label as more Republican out of a blue state of California. We did see a sort of flutter of a blue wave. There has been some shifts, demographic switch shifts within Orange County. Interesting enough, again, we just had two seats flip back um, to Republicans. So, for example, up to the north, um, if I go up here, one that was recently in the news was the 39th district. And that was uh, flipped from a Democratic Gil Cineros to, again, a Republican Young King. So these are shifting, right? Um, and it's important to take a look at um, after each census, right, how that uh, redistricting, that reapportionment, right, could affect um, these sort of political boundaries. So one thing that we're going to be taking a look at is something called gerrymandering. Now, gerrymandering is when one party controls the legislative and executive branches of the state. They may redistrict their state to increase the number of House seats that their party is likely to win. So it, the process is called gerrymandering, and where it gets its name, you're like, why is it called gerrymandering? Uh, it gets its name after Governor um, Jerry of Massachusetts. So when he redrew one district, they kind of thought it looked like this weird kind of like salamander kind of shape in the 1810 census. So you can see like Jerry, 
and then salamander. Mm. Gerry, no, no, okay. Gerrymander, okay. Uh, so the two, two aims, I should say, of gerrymandering, number one would be to maximize the effect of supporters' votes. And then at the same time, the other piece of that would be to minimize the effects of opponents' votes. So how do you actually gerrymander? There's a couple ways that we can look at it. The first one is to gerrymander, you can crack, right? You can crack a group of voters. So today, both parties have highly sophisticated computer software and data analysis, right, helps them crack and pack their district. So cracking is basically spreading out the voters of a particular type among many districts in order to deny them a sufficiently large voting block in any particular district. Now, a good example of that cracking that has occurred is in Ohio. So if you check out, for example, right here on the screen, it says Franklin County located right in the middle of the map. Located in Franklin County is actually a large concentration of liberal Democratic voters living in the city of Columbus. So notice in this case, what you see is um, the way it's drawn, it's split now into thirds. So each segment attached to is basically outnumbered by the largely conservative suburbs that vote Republican. So if the legislator cracked the district by spreading out all those liberal Democrats into three separate districts, where now basically if you're doing the math right, they're always going to be outnumbered by conservative Republican voters, right? Pretty sneaky when you think about it. The other one that we take a look at, we, we have conversations of gerrymandering, is something called packing. So with a packing strategy, you're trying to concentrate as many voters um, of one type into a single district to reduce the influence of other districts. So notice again on the screen, right, you're thinking how, what was the purpose of drawing this weird, there's no rhyme or reason, right? It's not like a simple square or just simple circle around a city, right? It's these very long, wonky kind of ways that they reorganize the map. So an example of this would be in Illinois' fourth district. So they packed Hispanic voters into one district in hoping to get, again, more Hispanic voters, more voice, and again, more accurate representation. So how can gerrymandering affect voter outcomes? The goal of gerrymandering is to produce sort of safe seats. So a safe seat is when a district is almost certain to be won by whatever political party drew the district, right? If Republicans are drawing it, or if Democrats uh, are drawing it in that case way, it's going to go red or it's going to go blue. Um, gerrymandering was effective because of the wasted vote effect, right? If I'm voting in a predominantly the majority, right, is, for example, if I'm voting in a conservative district, even though I might be voting, again, more rib, uh, liberal or Democratic, it's not really going to have a bigger effect of the outcome of that district, right, the way it's drawn in that case. So by packing opposition voters into the district, they've already basically win. So the wasted voters can be maximized. Now, I think without even going to this list, I probably think, you know, listen to this video, you're thinking, okay, there's some, there's something going on here. There's some criticism. There's some problems here, right? So what are some criticisms of gerrymandering? It lessens the competition of safe seats. It uh, can lessen campaigning, decrease their voter turnout, right? So sometimes candidates, right, they kind of label it as an easy win. They already know that they're going to get the win, the way the lines are drawn, and they don't necessarily have to go out and really, you know, work for it or really sell it or really, you know, try to swing the voters to make sure that they are proving that they are the right person for the job. Incumbents are usually easily reelected, as you can imagine. Um, incumbent politicians may look out more for their party's interests, right? If they're drawn a particular, whether it's Republican or Democrat, they may be more tuned into what the party needs versus really sort of tuning into the people that they're representing, the constituents in that particular district. Um, gerrymandering may be advocated, may be advocated to improve representation within the legislature legislation, I should say, among otherwise underrepresented minority groups. 
So the argument is right. It could be drawn in a way that actually could pack right minority groups together and actually give them, you know, strength in numbers in a way that they would get a strong voice and accurate representation in the House of Reps. So obviously you can imagine, right, gerrymandering is very controversial. It can lead to some of those other groups marginalized. Um, so there's a lot of things to unpack, so to speak, with, with gerrymandering. And you're probably also asking the question, right, is this even legal under the Constitution, right? Basically redrawing the lines to win, uh, you know, win your party into um, office. How does that even allowed in the Constitution? So um, Supreme Court comes into play, right? We've looked at some Supreme Court cases and we looked at civil liberties. So it's important to know, right, the Supreme Court has a very important voice in terming what is constitutional, what is allowed. Now, it's also, before I, I go through this, I also want to know, notice how the years, 1960s, a lot of these court cases were decided right around the time of the civil rights. So we talked about the Voting Rights Act, right? So this is something to also kind of, you know, kind of connect back to our uh, history and a little bit of our previous discussions. So one, one that I at least want to mention is in 1962, Baker versus Carr. The Supreme Court ruled that under the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, the federal courts could begin deciding redistricting cases. And that led to the second one, which is Westbury versus Sanders in 1964. Now, in that particular case, the size of Georgia's 10 districts varied across um, at different sizes, 400 to 800,000, right? There was a big discretion. So voters in the largest district sued, claiming the size of their district per deprived them of equal representation. So the Supreme Court agreed and established the principle of one man, one vote. So everyone's vote must be worth the same, and ideally, right, congressional districts must be drawn relatively equal in size. So um, more to unpack here, right? Um, after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there was also, again, um, some states created majority and minority districts. So drawing the districts of the minority group, and a big one to take note of, right, after Voting Rights Act, we're talking about African Americans. Um, this practice was called affirmative gerrymandering. So if, when you address something as affirmative gerrymandering, kind of think of like affirmative action, right? Affirmative gerrymandering was supposed to um, sort of address the, um, obviously, discrimination and ethnic minorities, right, not having a voice. So again, the main focus was on African Americans at the time. Um, so since then, kind of fast forward, since the 1990s, gerrymandering has... Um, you know, based on solely racial data, has actually been ruled unconstitutional. So the concept, right, of just looking at, solely looking at um, race or ethnicity. So some court cases, just to mention, right, first in Shaw versus Reno, and then Miller versus Johnson. The outcome of some of those court cases is that you can take race into account when you're drawing districts, but it can't be the only thing that you take into account while drawing districts. All right, with that, I think that's a lot to take a look at. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right here. Um, I do have some review questions on the screen and we'll be sort of working with these in class and also be thinking about how we can connect them to um, current events. So go ahead and just pause for a minute and making sure that you um, have a chance to review. And if there's anyone that you don't recognize, you might want to go back and repeat the video. It kind of just makes sure you're ready to go when we discuss in class. All right, team, I look forward to seeing you back in class. Stay tuned.